Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't uh, know who I am, my name is John Grove. I'm on the faculty at the Princeton Station. I'm in the plant and soil science department. Uh, Rebecca couldn't be with us. She's uh, on vacation. And so asked me to uh, do the introduction and, and uh, guide everything in the, uh, in the intro. So today, um, it's my pleasure. Indeed, I was the one who nominated Dr. Kissel for this uh, Distinguished Alumni Award. Some, some careers are a little too numerous to just remember. So I want to start here talking a little bit about the context of Dr. Kissel, start here. Dr. Kissel was born in Southwest Indiana and got his first degree in agronomy at Purdue University. He came here and did his master's degree under the mentorship of Dr. Raglan. And then he finished a PhD with Dr. Thomas. During that time, when Dr. Thomas came here from Texas. He was negotiating with the department and with the college and in a certain sense with the university because one of the conditions of Dr. Thomas's coming here, one of the reasons they were able to pull him away was they were forming the very first PhD program in the College of Agriculture, which was in soil science. The first graduate of that PhD program in soil science was Dr. Kissel. <laughs> so, when he completed his dissertation, he went to work at the Blackland Research Center near Temple, Texas. And then he went on to serve as associate professor, assistant director, and finally at the Kansas State University. He became professor there, and then he moved in 1989 to be the head of the agronomy department or crop and soil sciences department as the University of Georgia. After that assignment, he moved on and was director of the entire agriculture and environmental services lab in Athens for about 13 years, 13 years, 13 years. And he was appointed professor emeritus subsequent to his retirement. Dr. Kissel's research work was some of the earliest work, particularly in ammonia volatilization. And he authored with his students 128 referee journal articles, nine fully published conference papers, 13 book chapters, 17 experiment station bulletins reports, and about 38 popular scientific extension pubs. He was co editor of a book called Ammonia Volatilization from Urea Fertilizers. It was published in 1988. Dr. Kissel worked professionally, gave a lot of service. He worked to establish the U.S. National Committee on Soil Science, which would represent the soil science profession to the U.S. National Research Council, U.S. NRC, of the National Academy of Sciences. And he also was president of the International Soil and Plant Analysis Council from 08 to 10. He served as associate editor for the Journal of Environmental Quality and the Fertilizer Issues Journal. He was editor and editor in chief for the Soil Science Society of America Journal and the Soil Science Society of America, respectively, for a three year period. And he served as president of the Soil Science Society of America in 1995. In recognition of all of his achievements, not just in research, but in other ways. He's been named a fellow of the American Society of Agronomy, a fellow of the Soil Science Society of America, and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I, when I nominated Dr. Kissel, I kind of realized that um, in some ways he represents in soil science some of, obviously, for a historian like me, the oldest but he also represents some of the best of our profession. And I welcome him here today. 
tenga. Well, I've been meeting with students and faculty this morning and this afternoon early. And I've talked about a lot of the content of my talk that you're going to hear today. We decided that repetition was a good thing. So, so I'll start with that. Well, first of all, thanks to John for nominating me for this award. And thanks to the committee that selected me to receive this award. It's certainly an honor. Um, and I feel honored to present this lecture and to visit with students and faculty throughout the day. I'm especially thankful for two things. Number one, to have chosen the career of soil science that I love, and number two, about the many collaborations with many scientists to learn about the intricacies of soil science. It's been an honor to work with many people in three different states over a period of several decades. I was born and raised on a farm in southwestern Indiana, roughly in the, in the north central part of this slide. You see the town of Hobstadt, that was considered a hometown. And, um, this area was settled in part by immigrants from Germany in the mid 1800s. And uh, my teachers were Catholic nuns at St. James Elementary School near home and by nuns and priests at Modern Day High School in Evansville, just across the river from Henderson, Kentucky. So I was almost a Kentuckian native, Kentucky native, but not quite. So why did I become a soil scientist? The farm where I grew, grew up in the decades of the 1950s had a big influence on me. For example, the barn was a focus of a lot of agricultural activities such as feeding animals, milking cows, storing hay, and other activities such as, for example, playing basketball. We had we had a basketball goal on both ends of the hayloft. So whenever hay was fed out and there was time, it got some use as well. Hay was produced in a crop rotation of corn, soybeans, wheat, and red clover. The clover year was to produce hay supplemented by hay from an alfalfa field that was nearby. On the three mile trip from our house to the Hornville Tavern, three miles up the road, I could count seven dairies, small dairies on the way up the road. That is not the case today. Certainly today, dairies are much larger and fewer of them. This is a slide of the Kissel family, but before I was born, I had 10 siblings, I was number 11, and I was probably, you would consider me to be a menopause baby. I was probably a surprise, um, but this picture was taken in 1940, three years before I was born. There were many discussions among my brothers about crop yields, soil erosion, land values, questions such as, are those yellow corn leaves due to drought or lack of fertilizer? I listened and I began to form my own opinions. We were put to work at an early age in the Kissel family. <laughs> That's me going out to spread some clover seed. Just kidding, of course. <laughs> After high school, I enrolled at Purdue University to study agricultural economics, I thought. But in my first year, I was taking intro soil science uh, taught by Jim Ulrichs, and I realized I was missing something. 
soil science was very interesting. I love chemistry and I decided to switch my major to agronomy with the science option to take more heavily sciences like extra physics, chemistry, et cetera. Now, while at Purdue, I had a significant diversion. I believe that rowing for the Purdue crew reduced my GPA a bit, but it was fun and a little bit like military training, I suppose. Um, but I did enjoy it. And I eventually got my degree And I, and I received some assistantship offers from various institutions, and I took one at the University of Kentucky. So I began graduate studies at the university in the summer of 65, taking an analytical chemistry class and looking after my master's research that had already been started by Dr. Raglan and his staff. My thesis research dealt with measuring the redistribution of essential min mineral elements in corn from vegetative plant parts to the developing grain. Now, there was another diversion in my life. The rooming house where I slept at night was shared with recent graduates from Berea College many of whom were graduate students are studying professional degrees like law and medicine. At least one of them thought I needed some female companionship <laughs> and the blind date with their friend and recent Berea graduate worked. And I married Mary Seneca from Bristol, Tennessee, late summer, 1966. In late fall 66, I defended my thesis successfully and published a refereed paper from the, from the research. What I learned about myself is I could read the literature and understand it. I gained valuable laboratory experiences needed to collect the data. I could put in the long hours to do the work and I could interpret the data and write about it. This is the final challenging piece and on this final point, to the students in this audience, it is only when you describe your data in writing, your experiment, and, and the resulting uh, reviews of others that you fully clarify your thinking. And you may have to do some additional research to clarify a certain point or two, but it's only then when you fully learn and understand what you have done. So meanwhile, as I finished the MS degree, I decided to continue by working toward a PhD degree, this time with more emphasis on soil chemistry. I signed on with Dr. Herb Massey as my major professor with my research to be done in Northeast Thailand, part of a large grant received by the university. But these plans were stopped when our son Eric was born in late May 1967, premature and weighing three pounds and 12 ounces. He had serious health problems. The Thailand research was not to be for me, but I continued to cont uh, take more coursework, uh, courses in clay mineralogy, more chemistry, uh, plant metabolism, et cetera, more math. And then Grant Thomas was hired. He was hired by the University of Kentucky from Texas A&M, where he had been a professor for several years. He became my major professor. I soon learned a lot about soil acidity from him and the papers that he recommended that I read. But what was most exciting was the Grant Thomas approach to doing the quick lab experiment and then immediately working with and discussing the data. Grant was a master at designing the simple but elegant research that was understandable even to me at the time. 
He was often in the lab doing his own research, so he was readily available for discussions. A few opinions by Grant. Grant was not shy about who he thought was doing good research, and for that matter, who wasn't, <laughs> and which papers were key to advancing knowledge in soil chemistry. He also offered opinions to his PhD students. Here are a few of his statements that I do remember and with which I agree. First of all, read the old papers, even though they may be 50 to 75 years old. A prime example for me were two papers published by F.P. Veach, that's V-E-I-T-C-H, in 1902 and 1904. These papers showed an early and correct view of the key role of aluminum chemistry in acid soils. This research was ignored after the invention and introduction of the pH concept by Danish scientist Sorensen in 1909. And efforts to measure pH in the teens and 1920s by many soil scientists, I'm sure. Of course, this error was made even worse by the commercial introduction of the Beckman pH meter in 1934. Another comment by Grant After you take your first job, do not continue your PhD research, expand your knowledge by working in new research areas. Another, have opinions about unsettled issues in soil science and voice them. But here's the important part. If your opinion is shown to be wrong, form a new opinion based on the scientific evidence and voice it. Maybe a good bit of advice for many other disciplines, including politicians. <laughs> and then here is the last opinion by Grant. If suitable, help implement your research by working with your colleagues in cooperative extension. The job search. So in late summer of 69, I was close to finishing my research. So soil science jobs of interest to me were the following. University of Kentucky had a position in soil fertility at Princeton, Kentucky. I made a visit to Princeton with Brandt, took a look at facilities and considered that. Eventually Lloyd Murdoch was fired, uh, hired into that position. There was another position at the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station in New Haven. Um, I would have been able to work with Char Charlie Frank and Bridge Sawney there. And that looked interesting, but it was. Um, but there was another opportunity at the Black Line Experiment Station in Temple. I took the job in Temple because it had guaranteed funding beyond the first two years. The Connecticut job was only a postdoc funded for two years, so that was an easy decision. So after successfully defending my dissertation, Mary and I set out for Temple with two babies and pulling a U-Haul trailer. This 1,000 mile trip took four parts of four days. We thought we could make it on the third day, but it was just too hard. <laughs> we got about two hours from Temple and decided to get a motel room. So then I left Mary with two babies in an apartment to attend the agronomy meetings. Here she was in a strange town for the first time. Mary never let me forget about leaving her for the agronomy meetings, but of course I was just gone for a few days. <laughs> A little bit about the staff and the environment at Temple. The Black Line Experiment Station was largely a USDA ARS facility with emphasis on watershed research and soil erosion control, similar to other locations like Coshocton, Ohio, and Stoneville, Mississippi. There are at least 10 of these locations around the country. I was the only scientist paid by Texas A&M in November of 1969. 
Earl Burnett was the ARS location leader, but he also managed the state program's budget, the budget for Texas A&M at Temple. My laboratory was in a wooden frame building with painted wooden bench tops that sagged in the middle due to water standing on them, <laughs> but that was okay. There was a promise for a new lab, and the new lab facilities were realized in 1972 or 73, I can't remember the exact date. Okay, and a little bit about Texas soils in the Temple area. As you will note from the soil properties, Houston black clay, the main agricultural soil in central Texas, Black Land Prairie, is highly calcareous, high in clay content, with a high CEC of about 58 mil equivalents per 100 grams. So we measured similar values for samples uh, from other samples taken from the experiment station. This sample was taken from several miles from the station. So it was a common, common soil type for the area. So even if I had wanted to, I could not have done what Grant Thomas recommended that I not, not do. In other words, I could not have continued my dissertation research on acid soils <laughs> in the land of calcareous soils. These soils were very high in potassium. So in fertilizer rate studies, um, crop yield increases were largely due to nitrogen. So nitrogen studies received the most of my research attention. Just a little bit about research questions at the area. Enrique Gensch, who worked with Grant Thomas on a master's thesis while both were still at Texas A&M, found the nitrogen fertilizer recovery on coastal Bermuda grass was about 40%, which is not good. Typical results in East Texas on sandy soils would be double that easily, 80%. So the reason for the lower recovery was unresolved, but it was a project to be worked on. A little bit more on this later. A little bit about the climate at Temple. It's the importance of the precipitation patterns at Temple and the Southern Plate, Great Plains. First of all, the precipitation drops off quickly going from east to west. Temple is centered in the middle of the medium green area. What you can't see from the map is that precipitation is also highly variable from year to year, which leads to a key paper we published on this topic. This is the title of the paper, the authors, and the citation. It was a Texas Agricultural Experiment Station miscellaneous publication. A brief overview of this paper is as follows. In this paper, we estimate the most profitable nitrogen fertilizer rate for grain sorghum grown on Houston black clay soil as a function of water available in the soil, the cost of nitrogen, and the price of grain given characteristics of the precipitation in, in Central Texas. Key elements of the study were six years of existing data on grain sorghum yield response to nitrogen and the water balance model of Richardson and Ritchie. This shows, this slide shows the nitrogen response for two years of data out of those six years. Those are the two years of extreme data. Each of the six years of grain yield as a function of nitrogen rate was fit with a quadratic equation. Showing here are the extreme two years of data, as I said. The most profitable nitrogen rate would differ substantially between these two years, but would be the nitrogen rate in both cases where the slope of the fitted data, the, those lines that you see, was equal to the ratio of fertilizer cost to grain price. The 1968 year had zero water stress, plenty of rain that year. 1963, the bottom curve had 44, what we call stress days. 
Okay, how do we calculate stress days? The daily water balance, here we're talking about evapotranspiration, water used by the crop, in other words, and precipitation additions was simulated for each of the six years, 1963 to 68, the six years of data that we had, using weather records for those years. Stress days were calculated daily when less than 62.5 millimeters of plant available water remained in the soil. See here that if the soil is full of water at the beginning of the growing season, it contains 250 millimeters of plant available water. So for example, in the calculation, if 31.25 millimeters of water remained at a particular day's end, the model would calculate 0 0.5 stress days for that day. And then you would just sum them up. Next day would be another day. You would sum up the stress days for that day and just accumulate that data. I think you can see that if ET is six millimeters per day with a, you know, a fully growing crop, in 30 days without rain, you would remove 180 millimeters of plant available water from that full profile, no longer full, you're down to 60, stress, uh, 60 millimeters of water. Now we had, as I said, we fit the data to a quadratic equation for each of the six years of data. So each parameter of the quadratic equation for the six years of data was made a linear function of the number of stress days. So for the working, the working equation would predict grain yield as a function of nitrogen fertilizer applied and the number of stress days. Remember that the fertilizer, most efficient, most profitable nitrogen fertilizer rate depended on the slope. So it will depend on the second and the third of those two term, three terms. So how well did that equation work? We collected four years of our own data from 1971 to 74, and it showed that the yield could be predicted well with that working equation that had stress days as a component of the equation. The stress days calculated for those years were 44, 7, 3, and 20 for the years 1971 to 74, respectively. So the data, you can see the one-to-one -one line, there's pretty good agreement with that. So the data covered the range of expect, expect, expected stress days very well. Now, the next thing we did was to simulate the water balance and the stress days for each of the 60 years of existing weather records for Temple. We had 60 years of data that had been collected over the years at the weather station, at the experiment station. This simulation used a planting date of early March and a stop stress date calculation of July 14th. I am showing both unconditional and conditional probability distribution in the next few slides. This is the unconditional probability distribution. So this is just a uh, ordering of the data from the 60 years of simulation. So there on the very left-hand side of that graph, there were about eight or nine or maybe 10 years with zero water stress. And then after that point, there were years with more stress and continuing increase in water stress until the last of the 60 years, the year with the greatest stress had about 60, 62 stress days. So what can you do with that? Well, you can say, for example, if 20 stress days and greater is worth, uh, worth considering to reduce your fertilizer rate, you can say, well, about 20% of the time, you'll have more than 20 stress days. Or 80% of the time, you'll have le less than 20 stress days. But here's where you, if you do what is called a conditional probability distribution, and this is just one that you can consider, this is for the condition of April. 
Remember, we're planning this from March 15th. So April 1, the crop is just but up and just germinated, barely using any water. But there were six years of the 60 that had less than 3.9 inches of plant available water on April 1. So unless you get a whole bunch of rain with that crop using water pretty regularly, you're gonna have a lot of stress and your nitrogen fertilizer needs are gonna be considerably less. And that indeed is what the case is. I, I could spend a whole lecture or period on this study, but this is just a summary. So the lessons we learned from that experiment was the water balance is important to nitrogen fertilizer, new fertilizer use. Collaboration is useful for making progress. It's okay to use other data that you haven't collected. And of course, this data was not published. It was belonging to the experiment station by my, collected by my predecessor, Elton Cook. And lastly, simulation models, it taught me, can be very powerful tools. Okay, a little bit about another research area that I spent quite a bit of time on, and that is on a volatilization of ammonia from surface applied fertilizers. A Texas A&M colleague showed us some limited data in a conference meeting we had somewhere that an acid salt like ammonium sulfate could quickly lose considerable ammonia when applied to the surface of a calcareous soil like Houston black clay. This led to research that we'll, I will summarize in the next few slides. First of all, this is a methodology slide um, I'll mention briefly. It shows soil chambers, shows one soil chamber in the upper right-hand corner filled with soil, um, fertilizer applied, a cap installed, um, a, an air compressor then started, to force air through the system and through multiple of those soil chambers, the escaping ammonia from the surface applied ammonium fertilizer would be captured and measured. Now that's a very complicated slide. I'm not gonna spend much time on it except to say two of those six ammonium fertilizer sources are common nitrogen fertilizers. The second set of bars from the left is ammonium sulfate, commonly used as a fertilizer. And second from the right, ammonium nitrate used to be a common nitrogen fertilizer, not used very much now because it makes a good explosive and terrorists have taken to use it regularly when they can get their hands on it. So it's fairly restricted use. But at the time it was a very important fertilizer and the, the mechanism that which caused a difference in the, in the loss, and let me just emphasize that the loss from ammonium sulfate was about 50% in the laboratory measurement. Ammonium nitrate, on the other hand, lost probably a little under 20%. Why the difference? We wanted to know. It's important to understand mechanisms for why things work the way they do. So, let me just say this, that the amount of ammonia loss from the compounds was related to the solubility of the calcium reaction product. So the calcium reaction products, and these two examples for ammonium sulfate is calcium sulfate, which is relatively poorly soluble. Only two tenths gram of calcium sulfate will dissolve per liter of water. At the bottom, ammonium nitrate gives you a far different result. Calcium nitrate, which would be a reaction product, will dissolve to the tune of 133 grams per liter of water. And from any freshman chemistry idea of this, anytime you have a precipitate as a reaction product, it drives the reaction to the right. So in the case of 
ammonium sulfate, that drives the reaction to the right to form more ammonium carbonate, probably ammonium bicarbonate. At the bottom, there is less incentive to drive that reaction to the right. There's very little incentive because calcium nitrate is very soluble. And this shows the, what happens to the soil pH for those two conditions. The uh, ammonium sulfate is the top line with the triangles. It pH, its pH raised to about 8.2 or 8.3 at the peak. Ammonium nitrate, which is similar compound, both have a pH of about 4.5 in when dissolved in water, but its pH didn't per, uh, go much above seven. The natural pH of this calcareous soil was 7.7. .7. So the big difference in pH is a response to the solubility of that reaction product. So the next question is, Do these lab results really work that way in the field? If you're going to tell farmers a certain thing, you want to be sure that what you tell them is absolutely going to be the case out in the field, not in the laboratory. So the answer, well, let me first say that Bill Hargrove, who will be mentioned a little bit later in this talk, he was a technician and graduate student, and Bill first um, worked for me full time and part time uh, during the school year um, when he completed a BS degree in ecology at Baylor University. When he completed his degree at Baylor, I recommended Bill to study for the master's degree at Texas A&M and to do his research at Temple. Bill's research question is, do the laboratory measurements carried out at near constant temperature and water content in the laboratory estimate well the ammonia loss of nitrogen fertilizers in the field? I'm repeating myself, I realize. The answer based on his master's research was yes for ammonium salts, but no for urea-based fertilizers because ammonia loss from urea was highly sensitive to water potential at the soil surface. When the surface soil reaction, surface soil reaches air dryness in the field, which it does very quickly in the Great Plains environment, urea hydrolysis stops and drives ammonia loss uh, to the right. Ammonia salts are much less sensitive to water content at the soil surface. Um, losses persist with ammonium salts even from an air dry soil surface in the field. Some of Bill's data illustrate this fact. I'll just quickly go over that. He compared uh, um, nitrogen uptake from a non volatile source, calcium sulfate, versus ammonium nitrate and ammonium sulfate applied in a tougher couple of different methods. The losses indeed in the field ranged for ammonium sulfate from 40 to 55%. Ammonium nitrate, three to 10%. So the answer was yes. Um, those laboratory measurements gave us a correct answer for what, at least in this experiment, happens in the field. Bill's thesis research included a, um, another study using a chamber method to just measure directly the ammonia loss from ammonium sulfate. And this shows those results. For one study, ammonium sulfate was applied at a rate typical for application to coastal Bermuda, Bermuda grass for hay production. And what you see for four days are the rate loss in the upper part of the graph for ammonium loss and the relative humidity at a weather station nearby in the bottom part of the graph. So the peak loss rates occurred during the high relative humidity in the early morning, and it slowed down in the late of the afternoon. So this is consistent with our react reaction mechanism, I think. And again, with the direct measurements here, the ammonia loss was about 40 to 50% um, from ammonium sulfate. 
just show you a few slides here about an automated device we use to measure ammonia loss in the field. These are saw chambers uh, that are about nine inches in diameter, a device with a reversible electric motor and a lid that would close for about 10 minutes out of every two hours. And a vacuum pump would be turned on in the uh, trailer that housed this equipment. Air would be pulled across the soil surface that had been fertilized with ammonium sulfate. The ammonia captured and measured, and from that we could measure ammonia loss in the field. That's another picture. That's some of the pictures of the devices. And finally, to sum up what I have to say about uh, ammonium, ammonia volatilization, we did a separate experiment that was never published. Top dressing wheat in 1978 with about 80 pounds of nitrogen per acre with three different sources, urea, ammonium nitrate, and ammonium sulfate. And you can see the losses are very low from urea about 2%, this is over a two week time period, again on this calcareous soil. But the answer is hydrolysis is very slow. It essentially stops at a dry soil surface. And of course this was applied during February, a cool time of the year. So reactions would be more, would be slower. Now you might ask the question, Where are these calcareous soils? And you can see in central Texas, some red calcareous soils, but there are a lot of calcareous soils in Northwest Iowa, Southwest Minnesota, and in the Red River Valley of the Dakotas in Minnesota. So there are a lot of calcareous soils around. Whether they would react the same as the examples in central Texas, I'm not sure. You can never be sure of anything unless you go out there and make the measurements. Just one other point here, one major point for students in the audience. The major point that I wanna make with this slide is that learning new methods can help you get answers to questions you may not find possible otherwise. Sabbatic leaves can play a key role in advancing science. In our case, a new method of using N15 tag fertilizer to, came to Temple from the National Fertilizer Development Center at Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Probably students in the audience don't know anything about the National Fertilizer Development Center because it was closed down in the early 90s. There is an International Fertilizer Development Center that works on the technology of fertilizers for the international community, but the national one was closed down in the interest of saving money. So anyway, this new technology that of using N15 that was brought to us from the National Fertilizer Development Center helped us to get some answers. I would just mention one thing. It helped us to determine the primary cause of low nitrogen recovery by coastal Bermuda grass, which it turned out was um, immobilization of nitrogen by soil organic matter. These clay soils behave much differently than sandy soils in East Texas with respect to the behavior of nitrogen cycling in a coastal Bermuda grass field. Again, in East Texas on a sandy soil, you could expect 80 to 85% nitrogen recovery in the harvested forage. In central Texas, you might expect 40% with an equal amount just immobilized and tied up by the soil organic matter. Well, here are Mary and the kids. Looks like they're dressed for Easter or something like that. Um, but anyway, Eric needed more than what he was was available to him for his health problems and educational problems um, at Temple. So we began to look for other work opportunities. 
Sometime in early 1978, I was invited to apply for the soil fertility position previously held by Dr. Larry Murphy at Kansas State University. And I was offered the job and accepted it. And we moved in the May, June period, 1978. This is a listing of research for the next decade. I'm not going to spend any more time describing detailed research except for the end. While at Kansas State University, my students and I continued some of Larry Murphy's research on dual pre-plant application of nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer, studies of nitrogen nutrition and growth of wheat, as well as some work on nitrogen fertilizer use efficiency and losses similar to the work that I've described here for Temple. Another responsibility that I had at Kansas State was to collate and edit the annual summary of soil fertility research being done in Kansas to be published in time for the Kansas Fertilizer and Chemical Association meeting held each December in Wichita. That was before the day of word processing, at least in the early part of that decade. So that was quite a challenge, but one that we knew we had to get done, and we did. Here are the courses that I taught at Kansas State University. I've inherited advanced uh, our undergraduate soil fertility uh, from Larry Murphy. Larry also taught a course in chemical fertilizers. I enjoyed teaching that course very much, and I learned a lot in the process. Advanced soil fertility is a course I developed after John Havlin came on deck uh, on, on the faculty and took over the undergraduate soil fertility. And then one semester I taught soil physical chemistry. Now at this point, you might wonder what if I've experienced both the research station environment as well as the uh, university environment. How might I compare those two? The university environment is much more intense. There's more time for exploration at the research station, at least it was in my case. There can be a greater mixture of disciplines in, a, in the adjacent offices at the research station. There certainly was for me. There were hydrologic engineers um, and uh, I use their expertise to advantage. And research stations are all different, of course, regarding staffing. Some are quite small. The unit at Temple was primarily a USDA ARS facility. So in late 87 and early 88, there were two opportunities presented to me to be chief editor for SSSA and department head at the University of Georgia. I took both of them. We moved to Georgia and I began as head of teaching and research in Athens on January 1st, 1989. Here was the structure of agronomy at the University of Georgia in 1989 with four separate departments of agronomy, each with its own head. There was a division of agronomy that linked the four departments with a division chair. So there was a department he had for each of those four units that you see there. I became the division chair in 1989 in the fall. Now, an economic downturn occurred in the early 90s and resulted in political pressure to reduce the number of administrators. I became the head of the combined four departments, renamed the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences, which the name it retains today. I served as department head at UGA for eight years. That was enough for me. <laughs> I asked to be relieved of head responsibilities and was given that relief in fall of 1996. I also served as SSSA president during the previous year, 1995. I took some time to retool for research, focusing on precision ag research, 
but also secured funding for ammonia volatilization, since I've had experience in that realm, to urea applied to pine plantations. So a lot of pine production in Georgia. This was a collaborative effort with my colleague, Miguel Cabrera. For those of you who aren't familiar with pine, tea, pine tree production in the South, they are fertilized with about mid-growth, they call it mid-rotation, with urea fertilizer, which is typically, typically applied by flying it on with fixed wing aircraft, sometimes with helicopters, but I think most commonly with fixed wing aircraft. Miguel and I contributed to you know, a better understanding of ammonia loss uh, with our work. Now, following a retirement, the Dean of the college, Gail Buchanan, asked me to be director of the Ag Services Labs. I accepted the position and began June 2000. There was a total of 28 full-time staff, including three faculty members. And in this role as director, I was able to carry out applied research and continue to advise graduate students. At the time, these labs did soil testing, water testing for minerals and for bacteria, forage testing, nutrient analysis of plants and waste, and pesticide analysis. I helped direct a few changes, um, such as adding NIR spectroscopy for forages and expansion of water testing, changes to the pH and lime requirement method, and the establishment of a number of online calculators useful for users. These are web-based programs. And of course, some of the extension publications were published during that time period. You can see these at the web address shown below. Another probability distribution. As early as 2001, we noted some changes in the soil pH measured in water were much too high to be correct, much some of the values were too high. And a few farmers and county agents told us so. Said last year we measured this value, this year on the same field we measured a value much higher. What's going on? We followed up with some applied research. In the fall of 2004, we changed to measure the pH in 100th molar calcium chloride instead of in water, based in part on the data in this slide. Shown here is the difference in water pH and the pH in 100th molar calcium chloride. So it's a water pH minus the salt pH for each of 20, 1200, I'm sorry, 1200 samples. The data has implications for routine soil testing. At low levels of soil solution ionic strength, soil pH measured in water are very sensitive to small differences in ionic strength. And they're often, particularly if the ionic strength is really low, they're often incorrectly, incorrectly high. The median value for these analyses turned out to be 0.67. In other words, when you go to the 50% probability that means that 50% of the samples are below that level and 50% are above. So the 50% level was 0.67 was the difference. However, it is the 20% of samples with a pH difference of 0.8 or greater. So if you can go to 0.8 straight up, it's about 20% of the samples with a greater difference. They are the most troublesome ones to consider because they are likely to need a line recommendation if the ionic strength is low, but pH in water is slightly above the target pH for recommending line. In other words, if they're incorrectly high, but they really should be low, you have not made a, a line recommendation for that farmer, and that's a mistake that you've made. So not receiving a line recommendation when needed is especially troubling problem for fields that are poorly buffered and highly spatially variable. 
In these cases, the field area with the lowest pH are at high risk for sensitive crops to develop aluminum and manganese toxicity. A number of other labs have begun measuring pH in salt solution after our lead, including Frank here at the University of Kentucky. He was right with us uh, on that change. But I mentioned some other labs. North Carolina, they analyze about 300,000 samples a year. They change in recent years. And a large commercial lab in Indianapolis, SureTech, they analyze about a million samples per year. They change to measure pH and Hunter's molar calcium chloride. So our research and our problems that we tried to solve did have an effect on other laboratories. We think that's a, a good thing. So I give credit to Bob Miller. Some of you know Bob uh, with his help on this subject with a joint paper that he and I published together. Okay, summing up. I've been fortunate over the years to have worked with many talented scientists, technicians, and lab and graduate students who have done a lot of work to improve our understanding of soil science and agronomy. At the risk of offending some, I'm going to name some names <laughs> who have really been a big influence on me in my career. First of all, John Ragland, who is in the audience now, who saw enough in me to take me on as a graduate student. Thank you for that. Grant Thomas, who made soil chemistry research fun and inspired me about quality research. Joe Ritchie, Blackland Research Center and later distinguished professor at Michigan State, who introduced me to simulation modeling and to the water balance in a crop production field. David Whitney, soil fertility extension professor at Kansas State, who showed me the best of an extension specialist. Bill Hargrove, my first graduate student, who later studied with Grant for the PhD and took his first job at University of Georgia. Bill was influential in recruiting me to UGA. Bill also served in leadership roles at Kansas State and University of Texas at El Paso. Miguel Cabrera, professor at UGA who did graduate degrees and a postdoc with me at Kansas State University. He was my first hire at the University of Georgia, and he was my most collaborative soil science colleague for over 40 years. I owe a lot to him. Larry West, professor and pathologist at UGA and Feng Chen, GIS and remote sensing specialist, both of who helped me with remote sensing and soil mapping. Bob Isaac, retired professor at UGA, who helped with under, me to understand soil pH and lime requirement changes that need, were needed at the UGA soil testing lab. Letitia Sonon and Paul Vendrell, Paul was deceased UGA professors and trusted colleagues for many years at the UGA Ag Services Labs who helped me with many changes there. And last but not least, Rick Hitchcock, IT manager, for the University of Georgia Ag Services Lab, who is the best computer programmer that I know. <laughs> I have a final recommendation to students. When you get your first job, be a good citizen of your employing unit. Maybe it'll be an academic department. Maybe not. And of your scientific society, serve on committees, review papers, et cetera. In other words, do your part to help the scientific enterprise to function smoothly. And my second recommendation is keep a daily journal of, to record things you did each day and how you felt about them. Some, day, some days may be blank. Many days in a row may be blank, <laughs> but that is okay. I regret I did not do this because these records mark in time your important contributions and what you thought about them at the time. Of course, you may already do this on Instagram and TikTok. <laughs> Thank you.
This is my partner, Mary, after 56 years. I want to recognize the key role that she played in my career as a partner through her support of raising three children, three moves and house changes while being outstanding in her own work. First as a K-State English composition teacher, next as assistant director, director of affirmative action at Kansas State, and then at Georgia for her role in establishing Georgia Options, an organization that served people with disability to live in their own home, including our son, Eric. Georgia Options served over 45 individuals at its peak of operation. I'd like to say a little bit more about Mary. Mary loved art. She painted in her early life. She wrote poetry mid-career and late after she was retired. It's little wonder then that our daughters found careers in the arts. Laura Kissel is a documentary filmmaker. Laura's right here in the, in the front. And she's also the uh, director of the School of Visual Art and Design at the University of South Carolina. And Kissel Harper, has her doctorate in collaborative piano and is right here also. She's a member of the music faculty at the State University of New York at Fredonia, as is our son-in-law, Jodan Harper, a member of the voice faculty at the State University of New York at Fredonia. So what happened to the science in our family? <laughs> I'm here to tell you there is hope. <laughs> Our granddaughter Amelia is a sophomore at Dickinson College in Pennsylvania, and she is majoring in biochemistry. She also plays the cello very well. Thank you very much. Questions for Dave. I'll ask you one. The ammonia volatilization you study in calcareous soil, how would you compare that to what we observe in terms of urease stimulated volatilization uh, in a no kill environment where you get it off the residue and all the leaf tissue surface? Well, there's two components to that question. One is, where are you in the country? If you're in East, in Western Kentucky, in no-till, you've probably got a lot of residue in the surface, which will hold up that urea. And if you have heavier dews than you have in Central Texas, you will not have a condition where you get 2% loss, but you might get more in Western Kentucky because it's a more humid environment. You probably have heavier dews enough to solubilize and cause urea hydrolysis to proceed so that you'll then get more ammonia loss. But I'm, I think sometimes we overestimate ammonia loss from laboratory studies where moisture and temperature are held at a more optimum kinds of conditions. <clears throat> A question about you know, when you made the when you made the switch from a from a water pH to a salt pH essentially, mm -hmm. and so obviously Frank has has adopted that here, but yet Don, I think our our lime tables in AGR one are still based on water pH. We so do a convert. We do a math map. Yeah, do a calculation for a water pH, and I guess it was mainly just kind of a communication issue rather than trying to to explain to everybody. What the water pH meant. How did how did you handle that in, in Georgia? That's Was a that very good question because farmers and fertilizer dealers are used to to knowing that if the pH is less than six, you're going to get a line recommendation. If it's more than six, you won't. So now you're measuring pH in a salt solution that in that will measure a pH that is typically on average six tenths of a pH unit less. So what do you do about that? What I did initially, what we did initially was to, to report on the salt test report 
two, two values of pH, a water pH and a salt pH. We called it the equivalent water pH. That was a mistake. Don't ever confuse farmers and fertilizers. <laughs> Never give two numbers. Never give two numbers where one will do. <laughs> what we ended up doing is putting a statement on the website. Here is how we measure pH. Here is why we measure pH the way we do. And here's how, here's what we report. And what we report was the measured pH in calcium chloride plus 0.6. But it's a but it's a more reproducible value and a more correct value and it avoids those very high out of range values. Okay. Another question. Um, so I worked in vineyards over the summer and uh, a big part of all that was nitrogen uptake. It's been like a big discussion in there and the different forms of nitrogen applied. Did you guys look into uh, uh, nitrogen application and um, not un like in uneven ground at all? Like how, like what's the most stable way for nitrogen to be uptaken in that sense? What is the most, I'm not sure I understood that question. <laughs> uh, so the vineyards are all on uneven slopes a lot of the time. You're talking about vineyards? Yeah. Okay, wine grape production. Yeah. Okay. And uh, a big part of that is we have to apply a lot of nitrogen and then end up losing a lot of it. Uh, so is there any, like where in your research that you found that things could stay more evenly with uh, the nitrogen? Like saving, saving nitrogen yeah, in that environment? A lower application of it. Well, can you get by with the lower application? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're producing wine with those grapes, I saw one uh, on a tour in California near Sonoma Valley for really high quality wine. They were starving the grapes, putting very little nitrogen on. They didn't want the grapes to grow very large. They wanted the, the ratio of the skins to the inner part of the grape to be large. They wanted more grape skins and less of the, of the rest of the fruit because it's the skin apparently that can make great wine. So maybe you could benefit by putting lower nitrogen rates to improve the quality of the wine. That just I'm just repeating what I heard. I don't know whether that is <laughs> functionally true or not. Any other questions? Well, I'd like to make this presentation to you, Dave. Um, this is a plaque. It uh, says the 2023 Distinguished Alumni Award is presented to Dr. David Kissel in recognition of significant career achievements as an alumnus of the Plant and Soil Sciences Department of the University of Kentucky. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Well, it's nice to be recognized after so many years. I started in 69 and finished up in 2013. So what is that? <laughs> 43 years or some something like something. that, 44. <laughs> so anyway, I appreciate it very much. It's been a lot of fun um, working with a lot of smart people, honestly. I've been really lucky in my career and I'm the first to admit it. Thank you again.